Well, we kicked off this series a few weeks ago, Cinderella Stories. We've been talking about some of the great underdogs of Scripture. Last week, we talked about the spies in Canaan. Um, We talked about a dead boy that was raised by Jesus. Today, I want to talk to you about Cinderella Prayers. Cinderella prayers, how to talk to God when all of the chips are stacked against you. Maybe the doctor's given you a bad report. <clears throat> Maybe you've, uh, somebody's told you that you'll never achieve your dreams. Maybe you have some, own, some of your own inner struggles about your future and your confidence and the direction that God is leading you. Today, we all need some Cinderella prayers. And I want to turn our attention this morning to the fifth chapter of the book of James. We're going to look at an Old Testament passage and a New Testament passage, James chapter 5 in the New and 1 Kings 17 and 18 over in the Old. And we're going to talk about these Cinderella prayers. Now, we've been enjoying the NCAA tournament, haven't we? How many of us have been watching? How many of us filled out a bracket? Okay. Come on. Yeah, some few people are excited. And, and some people have like been filling out like multiple brackets, right? Like, like, like four or five brackets. But nobody ever expected the St. Peter's Peacocks, the number 15 seeded St. Peter's Peacocks, to be in the Elite Eight for the first time in tournament history, a 15 seed has made the Elite Eight. Pretty amazing, isn't it? They are, yeah, come on, give it up. That is a Cinderella story. Some of my other favorite tournament Cinderellas were um, back in 2012, the Lehigh Mountain Hawks, uh, number 15 seed, defeated Duke 75 to 70 a decade ago. And then um, University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Does that sound like a JUCO or what? UMBC. They were uh, ranked number 16. They took down the number one Virginia Cavaliers in 2018. It was the very first time a 16 had ever beat a one. And there's just something in us that just wants to pull for the underdog. I mean, there's just something so exciting about seeing the down and outers, like be victorious. And maybe in your own life, you can kind of relate to that. Maybe you've got some, some, some adversity that's before you, or you got some odds that aren't looking in your favor. I want to remind you today that God has given us a great opportunity, and that is through prayer. In James chapter 5, verse 13, Scripture says, Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. And so the emphasis of James chapter 5 is that when we are struggling, when we are down, when we are the 16th seed, God has given us a great weapon, a great opportunity, and that is prayer. And when the doctors say it's not good, we should pray. Uh, When there doesn't seem to be a way out, we should pray. When you tried everything else, keep praying. The greatest asset that we have um, is prayer, and it is oftentimes the most least utilized opportunity that we have. Now, God answers prayers in a lot of different ways. Sometimes God answers instantaneously. We're going to see that here in 1 Kings chapter 18 this morning. Sometimes God answers slowly. Sometimes God answers different than maybe what we originally anticipated. Um, Sometimes God does all kinds of different things. But we know that God answers prayers. And I want to give you five things today to build your prayer life uh, so that you can have a Cinderella story. Okay, these are Cinderella prayers. And Cinderella prayers are, number one, filled with passion. Now notice um, James 5 is referencing Elijah the prophet. In James 5, 17, he says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently, and you ought to underline the word fervently, that it might not rain for three years and six months, and it did not rain on the earth. Now, because of the sin of God's people in the nation of Israel, Elijah the prophet said, God, don't let it rain until people get their heart right with you. And so it's it's been three and a half years, and it hasn't rained. So there's a famine in the land, right? People are destitute. People are desperate. People are afraid. People don't know what to do. And um, this is... 
you know, um, a, a trying time. But people's hearts had turned away from God. And so Elijah's there to help the people get back on track with the purposes of God. And it says here that he prayed fervently that it would not rain. And this word fervently in the language of the New Testament is one of the words that we is translated prayer. But it's the word that means like a humble supplication. It means like total humility before God. There's other words that are translated prayer in the New Testament. This word means like a humble request. Um, like, like somebody who is, is, is so uh, dependent on, on God. And so this is the manner in which uh, Elijah is talking to God. God, I am totally dependent on you. God, I absolutely need your intervention in this situation. And uh, Elijah realizes if God doesn't intervene, that the people's hearts are not going to turn back to God. So he has a humble plea. You know, this week I was driving around and I saw a guy that was asking for money on the side of the road at one of the major intersections in our city. And I, I was kind of looking at the guy because he didn't look like a normal person that, that would be in need. Um, he looked like he had bathed that morning. He was clean shaven. Um, he, he looked like, um, you know, he, he looked like he had just finished a workout over at Orange Theory. Amen. And he looked like he had walked and he had on nice clothes that were, you know, f- freshly washed. And he was asking for money on the side of the road. And I just looked at that guy and just kind of, you know, thought, well, I don't know if that guy looks that desperate, honestly. In fact, that guy looks better than most people that have a job. So I don't know. And then not too long after that, I saw a lady who looked absolutely destitute that was standing at another intersection. You know, she looked like she had it bathed in a long time. She, she looked sad. Um, she, she looked like she was in dire need. And I thought, you know what? I would so, I would so much rather help somebody who was really in need than somebody who, who, who was kind of faking it, so to speak. Amen. And I think that when James is, is when this word describes the, the the prayer of Elijah, it is talking about the latter. It's talking about a fervent prayer. It is talking about a humble plea. I absolutely need God's intervention in my life. If if this circumstance or this series is about to change in my life, uh, it's a beseeching prayer. It's a humble prayer. James five fifteen says. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick. So to be filled with passion, there's got to be like a humility. Here we see in verse 17, but also I want you to see in James 5, 15, that faith and prayer have to go together. If you really want to see God move in your circumstances, you have to believe as you pray. Now listen, we, we've all prayed prayers before that we, 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 we voiced them to God but we didn't really in our heart believe that God was going to show up. Amen? Like sometimes we just were kind of going through the religious ritual of, of, of this. Or, or, or we just didn't want to feel bad. We wanted to check the box, right? I prayed about it. But let me ask you, do you really believe that God is going to answer your prayer? Is, do you believe God is going to move? Do you believe God is going to do something? Do you believe that God is going to shake some things up? The prayer of faith. Look at that in verse five, uh, chapter 5, verse 15. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he's committed any sins, he will be forgiven. Um, and, and so we see prayer and faith have to go together. Um, uh, and, and I have found that my prayer life has been forged in the place of adversity. Right? Like, if you don't ever go through anything, you will never learn to pray. Let's be honest about it. The times that you learn to pray is when the bottom falls out. Amen? So, like, if you're really struggling today, you're in the perfect place for God to take your faith to a new level. You're in the perfect, you're in the perfect situation for God to build your prayer life, to teach you to be dependent on him, to do some, th- some things revolutionary in your life that probably would not happen if everything was smooth sailing and everything was easy and everything was going up and to the right and good and all that. <clears throat> God forges prayer in adversity. Um, Deuteronomy 4.29 says, From there you will search again for the Lord your God, and if you search for him with all your heart, and your soul, you will find him. 
So there, there, there's a passionate plea. And, and, and I want you to see that today. Listen, the person that's going to really connect with God in, in those times of difficulties is a person that is passionately praying. It's somebody who's, who's totally dependent on God. Um, a, a, a first Peter uh, ch- uh, chapter 3 um, gives us a little insight into that. And I'll come back to that in just a minute. But I, I want you to see a second thing. Um, passionate prayer um, Cinderella prayers are emboldened by righteousness. Okay? Uh, there's something about how we conduct our lives that directly relates to how we communicate with God. Okay? In other words, you can't live like the devil and expect God to do miraculous, supernatural things through your life, okay? So, so here's, here's, here's Elijah, okay, James 5, 16. So keep on confessing your sins to one another and praying for one another so that you will be healed. And then I want you to see this right here. The prayer of a, a righteous person is powerful and effective, okay? So listen, if you want to have a powerful prayer life, it starts with being a righteous person. Now, what is a righteous person? Okay, that, 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 that can be kind of a scary word, like righteous, like, woo, I don't know if I qualify righteous, you know. The Bible doesn't say that God answers the prayer of educated people. The Bible doesn't say that God answers the prayer of even sincere people. It doesn't say that he answers uh, the prayer of the person who is seasoned or persuasive. Because some of us are really great at making arguments to God, right? Like, God, let me tell you why you need to do this. God answers the prayer of the, it's the righteous person, okay? Now, righteous is not perfect, okay? Let's draw a distinction there because because you can be a righteous person and not be a perfect person. If you had to be perfect to have a dynamic prayer life, we would all fail miserably, Okay, we, we, we would all be disqualified. A righteous person is not a perfect person, but a righteous person is a person that realizes when they've messed up, they go to God and they ask for forgiveness. Do you see the difference? So it's not about perfection, but it's about acknowledging and realizing, hey God, I messed up over here. I'm struggling here. I need your forgiveness. I need some help, Lord. That, that's what righteousness is. And righteousness is also trying to do whatever God has called us to do, okay? So like in the life of Elijah, God tells him in 1 Kings 17, go down to the brook and I'm going to feed you. And and Elijah's like, well, okay, you know, and he goes down to the brook and what happens? The ravens bring Elijah biblical burgers, I like to call them. It's steak and and bread morning and evening okay how would you like that was before uber eats showed up okay and and but but elijah's in the right place at the right time a little bit after that the brook dries up and he goes and he talks to a widow first king 17 and her son and her have just enough food for one more meal and they're going to starve to death they're going to die and what does elijah say he says feed me first you know and that's one of the saddest verses of the Old Testament. I mean, it sounds so self-indulgent, like, like the prophet's like, feed me, and then you guys can die. Y'all don't even get your last meal, you know? But this was part of God's provision, and God had directed him, and God had led him. And so, so Elijah is not being arrogant, he's being obedient. Do you see the difference? Now, in 1 Kings 18, God has told him to confront the king about the sins of the people because because King Ahab, the king of Israel, is leading the people to worship pagan deities. When we see the life of Elijah, we see a man who is trying to do everything he can to follow the Lord's leadership in his life. And we're going to see in just a little bit that he wasn't perfect, but he did live a lifestyle that was uniquely acquainted with the power of God, and he was constantly submitting his life to the Lord, okay? So how can we remove some barriers from our prayer life, okay? First Peter 3, 7 uh, says this, if, if you are a husband, 
You should be thoughtful of your wife. Come on, somebody. Can I get a witness today? All the women said amen. Treat her with honor because she isn't as strong as you are and she shares with you in the gift of life. Then nothing will stand in the way of your prayers. Wait a second. How did how I treat my wife and my prayer life get rolled together? God wants us to walk in righteousness. And part of righteousness is the way that we treat our spouse. Do you see it? So there's a part of prayer that has little to do with asking. It's, it's about how you live. It's about the integrity of your life. It's, it's about the consecration of your heart to God. And, and a lot of times we don't put those things together, but but if you're praying about something and it's not happening like you think that it should, ask yourself, God, am I struggling in the area of righteousness? Is there some stuff that I'm doing that in honoring you that's a hindrance, that's a, that, that's a barrier? It might be a lack of faith. It might be improper motives. It might be some relational stuff. But God, show it to me so, so that I can fix it. And Elijah just had this desire to kind of do whatever God was leading him to do. Prayer should not be something that we do only in the case of emergencies. Prayer should be something that we do all the time. It's a lifestyle that God wants us to practice. And if you have an unholy life, you'll never have powerhouse prayers. So we got to pray with, with that sense of purity. Isaiah 59 two gives us a little insight into this, but there is a problem. Your sins have cut you off from God because of your sin. He has turned away and will not listen anymore. In other words, like, you know, the, the, there puts distance between us and God when there's sin that's undealt with. John 9 31, we all know that God does not listen to sinners, but he listens to anyone who worships and obeys him. That's walking in righteousness. So the good news is God is looking for purity, not perfection. And our prayers are emboldened by righteousness, but they are also inspired by power. Do you really believe that the power of God is released in and through prayer? Um, look, look back at James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective okay it's powerful and that word powerful in the language of the new testament is a word that we translate energy so so scripture is saying that energy from heaven is released when we pray now if we really believe that would it change the way that we talked to god like would we talk to god more confidently if we really believe that energy from heaven that God's mighty working power was being released into my circumstance, if I really believe that, would it change the way in which I communicate with God? The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and it's effective. Now, we all love to be effective, right? We're always looking for better means, you know, like, I want to be more strategic. I want to be, I want to be more disciplined, all that. Let me tell you, prayer is your ticket. Okay? It is both powerful and it is effective. It's powerful and it's effective. I want you to reach over and tell somebody um, beside you, my prayers are about to shake some things up. Okay, Can you do that real quick? Just, just, just lean over and tell somebody, right? my prayers are about to shake some. Doesn't that feel good? Yeah. <laughs> do you believe it today? Um, John 14, 13 says, I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father will be glorified in the Son. And Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7, Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you'll find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. So I want you to take a minute today. I want you just to dream. I want you to dream about what God wants to do in and through your life. And more specifically, your prayer life. Because prayer is inspired by power. Um, when you stop praying, you stop dreaming. Let me tell you, the greatest dreamers in the world are people that pray. Because when you pray, you, you receive the imagination of heaven in your life. And you begin to see your circumstance not 
in and through the way things are, but in and through the way that, that God wants them to be. And there's a big difference. People that lose their vision for their life are people that don't have a prayer life. Okay? If you've lost your purpose or your vision, get along with God and begin to talk to him. And God will begin to restore that to you. Now, 1 Kings chapter 18, which James 5 is referring to, is truly one of the great passages about prayer. Elijah challenges the prophets of Baal and Asherah, two pagan Canaanite deities, the male and the female gods of the Canaanites. They have 850 prophets, and Elijah challenges 850 prophets of these pagan deities, and he does it all by himself. Can you, you want to talk about underdog? You want to talk about Cinderella? Okay, listen, Elijah was not a 16 seed. He was like a 57th seed, okay? It's one man, one prophet, the other side has 850 prophets, but the difference is that Elijah has God on his side. You see, God is the one that begins to level the playing field, okay? This is not even close, but he says, listen, meet me up on Mount Carmel, which is a spiritual place in Israel where there's a lot of altars and people, you know, go and worship all kinds of gods. And he's like, meet me up on the mountain and we're going to have a, we're going to have a prayer duel, okay? And and all the people of Israel go up to the mountain and they're going to watch this thing. And Elijah says, I'll tell you what, why don't you guys kill a bull, put him on an altar, and I want you to pray to your God. And if your God, and you got Baal or Asherah, so you actually got two gods, you got an advantage. Y'all cry out to your gods, and if fire falls from heaven and consumes the altar, you guys serve the true gods and we'll all worship him. And the, 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 the pagan prophets are like, yes! So from 9 o'clock till 12 o'clock, they're crying out to their gods. They're praying. They're like, Baal and Asherah, come on, send the fire, baby. Let's do this thing. Let's show Elijah the prophet. And nothing's happening. And Elijah starts to talk trash. I mean, there, did you know, listen, Elijah could talk trash with the best of the NBA basketball players. I mean, read 1 Kings 18. He's like, Listen, maybe your God is using the bathroom. Maybe your God's on a trip. Maybe your God is busy, you know. You're calling the Lord and, and, he, and, and you're calling on your Lord and, 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 and he's on the other line. I mean, he's, he's totally trashing them. So, so these false prophets, they bring greater intensity. They start to do little dance, a little jig. They start to cut themselves and they go on for three more hours. Now it's like three o'clock in the afternoon. Elijah, meanwhile, is sipping a latte, sitting under an umbrella, soaking up some rays. He's got his feet propped up. He's like so dialed in. He knows that his God is going to answer. And he's just watching all of these pagan prophets make fools of themselves. And finally, he has enough. And he stands up and he's like, all right, get out of the way, guys. Let me just show you how this is done. And he has them pour a ton of water on top of the altar, okay? It's, it's like Elijah's making the point that like, my God is the true God. This is not trickery, okay? This is not sleight of hand. This is not David Copperfield kind of stuff. So they douse the altar with water. And then Elijah calls on the Lord. And a great fire from heaven comes down and consumes the offering. And everybody's like, Oh, maybe Elijah's God is the true and the living God. Maybe he's the one. And God answers by fire. Listen, man, what would, what would your prayer life look like if you believed that God was going to answer by fire? I mean, what would, it, what would it look like if you really believed that God was going to intervene in your circumstance and your situation, what would that look like? And Elijah's a great tool of God that God uses to turn the hearts of the people back to the Lord and away from these, these pagan deities. I mean, it's beautiful. You know, we have a great privilege to come before the God of heaven. And listen, I know that prayer can be intimidating. Sometimes people say to me, like, Pastor, I want to pray, but what do I say to God? What do I say to him? 
You know, Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. You know what? When you have a time of need, talk to God about that. That's a great starting place, isn't it? Just start with your time of need. Listen, when you come to God, you're going to find mercy and grace. And the grace is going to cover all the mistakes that you've made and the mercy of God is God's benevolence and his goodness in your life. And so that's what we have to, to gain and to benefit from, from, from God. But listen, don't be starstruck in your prayer life, you know? Don't be starstruck like, oh, it's like, it's God. I can't talk to him. He's too big. He's too mighty. I'm too small of a person. Have you ever been starstruck before? Have you ever seen somebody famous you know, a few years ago, I was at the U2 concert, and Lance Armstrong, you know, the biker, he was there. He was walking around like everybody else. I was like, Ryan, this is your opportunity. This is before he was found out to be a cheater, okay? He's winning all the Tour de France's and all that. And in my mind, I'm like, I'm saying to myself, Ryan, go up and introduce yourself. I'm like, you know, hey, Lance, it's Ryan. How you doing? But I got kind of starstruck. And so this is so creepy. I can't believe I'm telling you guys this. But I just walked up to him and I brushed up against him. <laughs> and I didn't wash the jacket that I was wearing. <laughs> Have you ever been starstruck before? My stepdad looks exactly like the famous football coach, Barry Switzer. Okay. And yes, yeah, so we have a few of those around here. God help us. Yes. And if you don't know who Barry Switzer is, he was the coach of the OU Sooners, and then he won a Super Bowl with the Cowboys back in the day. He's not in the Hall of Fame, okay, but he's, but he's up there, okay. And, and my, my stepdad lives in Dallas, so people ask for his, his autograph. And he's always like telling people, I'm not Barry Switzer. And I told him, I said, listen, man, just embrace the moment. Just get the pen. You will make some kid's day. There's some dude that has been dying for a Barry Switzer autograph. Just start signing away, you know? But it's amazing to see how starstruck people are when they see my stepdad. Listen, when it comes to prayer, God doesn't want us to be starstruck. God wants us to talk to him with boldness and confidence, okay? And listen, you can't talk to God with boldness and confidence if you're so in awe or you're so nervous about how great that God is. God loves you. God is dying to communicate with you. The Lord is so excited to hear your prayers, okay? And when we begin to see our prayer life like that, God begins to do some really awesome, amazing, amazing things. God releases energy from heaven, you know? So it's an awesome thing. It's a beautiful thing, a wonderful thing. Um, I think you ought to pray about everything that matters to you. Sometimes we're like, well, we have this dichotomy. We have like our spiritual life, and then we have all of our other life. No, these things are all woven together, okay? So if you're worried about some things at work, guess what? You should be talking to God about what he wants you to do to deal with that difficult coworker. Okay? If you're praying about some of your investments or you're concerned about your investments, you ought to talk to God about that. If you're worried about your income, you ought to be praying about that. Listen, God will answer by fire. You know, I, I was praying for several years. I wanted to, to do a little bit of real estate investing, and I'm praying. I'm like, God, give me an opportunity. I don't know what to do. I'm praying for like two or three years. And one day I'm sitting on an airplane and I've got my real estate investment books out. This sounds very nerdy. And I'm reading and I'm talking to Gina. And the lady that's sitting next to me says, are you a real estate investor? And I laughed. I said, well, no. I, I said, I, I think I would like to be, but I don't, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm reading the books, right? But I don't know. And she was like, I would love to help you. She says, I, I work with investors and I want to help you. And this lady 
help me begin to invest in real estate. Now, I'm sharing that with you guys today. I just want you to understand that God is concerned about the things that you're concerned about. Okay? Like, if you, if you feel like God is leading your life in a certain direction, he's going to put some people there to help you. And, and this was a matter of, of consistent, intentional prayer on my behalf. And God just opened up the door. Now, you may have no interest in some of the things that I'm interested in, and that's fine. But God is interested in the things that you're interested in. You know, if you're worried about your children, you ought to be praying for them and maybe with them every single day. Put that on the prayer list, man. If you're concerned about your health, then God hears those prayers too. And, and so don't put God in a box and just say, well, you know, like prayer is something I do at church about spiritual matters, but prayer doesn't really intersect with my business or my family or my personal life or my whatever. Now, nothing could be further from the truth. Here's the final thing today. I want you to write this down. Cinderella prayers are cultivated by simplicity. Oh, excuse me, this is the fourth thing, okay? Simplicity. Okay, look at this. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. Okay, notice there, underline the phrase, a man like us. Elijah was a normal dude. Here's what I want you to see. God answers the prayers of normal people, okay? You don't have to be a missionary for God to answer your prayers. God answers the prayers of normal people. Elijah was a man like us. Now listen, I'm telling you, Elijah had some issues because if you keep reading into chapter 19, after the fire falls from heaven and the people turn to the Lord, the evil queen Jezebel sends a nasty letter to Elijah and says, listen, I'm going to kill you. And you would think, like, have you ever read the Bible before? And you're like, oh, I know where this story's going. And, and I'm waiting, you know, as I'm reading this chapter, I'm like, oh, I know Elijah's going to call fire down on Jezebel. He's going to fry her. She's next. No. What does Elijah do? Elijah runs away, goes into a deep state of depression, and prays for God to take his life. Wait a second. You were the hero of Israel. You were the man. You threw down on all the 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah, and now you have gone to hide? You know what? There's a little humanness in all of us, isn't there? Even this great man of God had doubt. He had uncertainty. He was depressed. He had just seen God do something amazing. And yet, what happened? <laughs> he was a man like us. Listen, prayer is cultivated by simplicity. And in Luke chapter 19, verses 1 through 4, or in, in, excuse me, in 1 Kings 19, 1 through 4, he kills all the prophets, the false prophets. But then he's afraid of, he's afraid of Queen Jezebel. Normal people can have extraordinary prayer lives. Okay? So, so Elijah struggled. I want you to see that. Elijah didn't always do what was big and bold and audacious. I think after chapter 17, where he gets fed by the ravens and takes the last meal from the widow. And then he, in chapter 18, when he calls down the fire from heaven, I think Elijah was like, okay, Lord, I'm done. No, my faith quota has been expired. And he's depressed and he's discouraged. Listen, you can be depressed and discouraged and God can still do great things in and through your prayer life. He was a man like us. I love that scripture reminds us of that because sometimes we put people in the Bible on, the, on like the highest planes you know like we're like well I'm like a normal person but then there's like bible characters that go way up here Elijah was a normal guy he had he had those struggles here's a fifth thing today we're running out of time it, it strengthened Cinderella prayers are strengthened by persistence okay and, and it says there in in um, James 5 16 and 17 Elijah was a man just like us he prayed earnestly it would not rain and it did not rain on the ground for three years and six months and then he prayed again and heaven sent rain and the ground produced its crops if you if you go to first kings 
Elijah prays seven times. Okay? And each time he prays, he sends the servant to go see if it's about to rain. He's on the, the side of the mountain there. And he prays the first time, and there's no sign of rain. Now, again, it's been three and a half years. So the people in Israel need some rain, don't they? The people have learned their lesson. They've turned to the Lord. Now it's time for the crops to grow. We need some water. And Elijah prays seven times, and on the seventh time, the servant comes back, and he sees, I see a small rain cloud, and a great monsoon uh, comes and pours out massive amounts of rain there, on the people of Israel. Elijah understood something. If you want God to do great things in your life, sometimes you have to pray consistently and repetitiously. In, in, uh, earlier in chapter 17 of 1 Kings, he prays three times for the widow's son to be raised. Okay, He prays seven times for it to rain after it hasn't rained for three and a half years. The best things in life are going to be the things that you pray over the most. Pray and don't give up. Pray and don't lose heart. Pray and don't get discouraged. Um, James, the writer of the book that has his name, was called Camel Knees in the uh, ancient church because he prayed all the time. He had big calluses on his knees all the time. And, And so when James is writing about Elijah, he's also speaking out of his own life experience. Okay, This is a guy that really, really knew about the power of prayer. And he's saying, listen, if you're going to have a dynamic prayer life, you got to stay on it. You can't pray one time and get discouraged or pray once and then forget. you got to stick on it. Um, Psalm uh, 88 verse 1, Lord, God of my salvation, I cry out to you before day and night. In Luke 6, 12, at that time, Jesus went off to a mountain to pray and he spent the night praying to God. That's before he called the disciples. Listen, when you have some big choices to make, you got to talk to God. You got to get with the Lord. You got to get with Him. There's something about that persistence and just sticking with it. I call these pit bull prayers. I came up with this term pit bull prayers before I got a dog. And recently we got a Havanese puppy. And if you don't know what Havanese dogs are, they're, they're, they're like small little dogs. Um, they're, this, we, we have a nine pounder. And she, I think she's full grown and, and, and she likes to play fetch all the time. But I don't know a lot about dogs. I'm frustrated with Lolly the Havanese because she goes and retrieves whatever you throw. But when she brings it back to you, she won't let go of it. Hey, have you ever seen a dog do that, right? And I'm sure there's some smart people that know how to train dogs. You got to release like the stuffed animal, right? She wants you to play. And she'll keep bumping you with it until you like rip it from her and throw it again, right? But it's kind of silly because because you would think that if she wanted you to play, she would give it to you. But instead, she wants you to, you know, strip it from her jaws and then throw it again. Well, we need to have some pit bull prayers, maybe some Havanese style prayers when it comes to God. We need to lock on to some things and not let them go. And that may mean that you pray about some things for years. We, we prayed for almost a decade to have children. It felt like seven decades, okay? Sometimes you have to get on something and you just have to stick with the stuff and keep talking to God every single day. And God's building your faith and God's building your life and God's doing great things. And, and, and you got to stick with it even when you're discouraged and even you, when you don't feel like praying and talking to God, you just keep bringing it to him because you're praying those pit bull prayers and you're not going to let it go. And God's going to do some beautiful things in your life. Listen, you may feel like the Cinderella. You may be facing the 850 prophets of Baal. You may feel like a number 16 seed. But God has given you a great resource. It's the power of prayer. Let's use it. Let's wear it out. Let's do great things for God as we call on his holy name. Will you pray with me for a minute?